I want to have a long career in tech, and it's becoming more obvious to me that I'm going to need to learn how to solve lead code problems. More and more companies are asking lead code style problems in interviews. Whether or not this is really relevant to the day-to-day -day work that we do, that's another question. But knowing that I'm going to, at some point in my career, have to answer these questions, if I ever want to switch jobs or if I ever need to switch jobs, then I better get good at answering these questions now. In this video, I'm going to walk you through how I approach lead code problems, not the actual algorithms and data structures. Anyone can teach you that. I'm going to show you how I do these things in Go. I have a few tools to make the flow very fast, and so I can get to a place where I have my tests all ready for me, and I'm ready to code pretty quickly, so I can spend more time on the actual question, and less time on the infrastructure. Okay, so here I am at the lead code homepage, and I'm going to click on problems here. And what I've been doing, just as I start off, is I go to the acceptance and I sort by highest acceptance. What this really means is this is the questions that people have gotten successful answers to. And that translates to these are the easiest questions in Leak Code. So as I'm getting used to Leak Code, I've been going through these questions and just doing the easiest ones. And uh, today, let's choose one that I've already done, but I think is a good example here. The question is 1828 queries on number of points inside a circle. I don't even start off by reading the problem. I start off by setting up my local dev environment so that I have a test harness ready for me so I can see if my answers actually work. I don't actually code in here because I find this very difficult to code in. I have a leet go directory where I keep all of the problems. Each problem has a folder. Each folder has a test file and the implementation. So we're going to make a folder for this problem right now. So make dir 1828 and I'll call it queries on point. Now I need to create the go file. What I'm going to do here is a little trick. I'm going to do touch dollar sign underscore slash dollar sign underscore slash go. And that's going to create the file for me. This dollar sign underscore works in bash and Z shell. It's going to use the last argument of your previous command line. So this is going to say touch this directory slash this file name dot go. And it's going to make that file for me. Now I'm going to open up that file in my editor. Okay. So I'm in an empty file here and I need to type the package and I call it leak code. And then I need to make a function, but they've already made a function for me. So I'm just going to copy this in. My editor is going to be mad that I don't have a return value, so I'm going to give it one. And I'm just going to give it the zero value. So my editor is happy now, and this obviously is going to fail, but it's a valid function. Okay, and now it's time to make a test. I don't want to create the test file and type out all the test code myself, so I'm going to use something to generate it for me. What I'm going to use is a project called Go Tests. It's written in Go. There are plugins for just about every editor, but I prefer to use it from the command line. Here's the command I'm going to run. Go tests all dash w dash parallel and the name of the folder. All, I want to generate a test for every function. Dash w, I actually want to write it and not just print it to standard out. Parallel, I want to use parallel testing in Go. Now it's generated that test for me. If I run ll again, I can see that file exists. Here's my function. Here's my test. My linter doesn't love the default template, so I have to make a few adjustments. I should at some point actually update the template. So this has generated a table driven test file for me. That's great. Here's the anonymous struct with uh, my tests. We get a name, the args, and what we want, which is an int slice. And that's exactly what was here. And if you look at args, this is the input to our function. So it's done that already for me. That's pretty great. So it's time to make a test case. I can give it an empty struct, but I really need to fill it out. Luckily, my editor with the language server protocol will help me out. Your editor can probably do this too. I'm going to fill out the anonymous struct. And then I'm going to fill out the args. And this is perfect. Now I'm going to jump back to this question, which I still have not even read yet, and get the example data.
This is my input. But I need to use curly braces. Same thing for the queries. And now the output. Oh, and I need to write the name. Example 1. I'm going to do the same thing for example 2. So now I have my two test cases. And I have my code ready to go. So I could run my test manually and confirm that it is failing. But I don't want to do that. I want this to happen automatically. There's a project called Gao, Go W, Go Watch, which is the Go command with watch enabled. I'll call it GOW for now. So I can write GOW test and then give it the implementation and the test file, and it's going to watch it for me. And if I make a change, it'll rerun the test. That's useful. There's also a program called GRC, which you can put in front of any command line, and it will print in color for you, assuming you've set it up properly. There are links in the description on how this works. So now my tests are ready in watch mode, and I can get to work on this problem. I like to keep my tests here on the side pretty small, and you can see if I return a slice with just a three in it, my tests will update automatically, and I can see they're still failing. Okay, now it's time to actually read this problem. This isn't a hard problem conceptually, but it might be hard to write if you haven't written something like this. I know it was for me. You're given a series of points, which are part of the input. You can see them here. And you're given a series of queries, which is really just these circles here. And you have to find out for each query, how many points are inside it. So I can see for this blue query here, there are two points inside it. For this green query, there are three points inside it. For this red query, there are two points. And here's the output. 3, 2, 2. So that makes sense. So now I need to write this code. I'm not going to put you to sleep making you watch me try and solve a lead code problem. I'm not sure where this completion comes from, but I'm sure it's available in your editor. If I type queries, which is a slice, and then hit dot, I get a bunch of options here. I can range over it just like that. So I don't have to type this whole for loop myself. If I want to know what the value of i is, I can do i dot print going to print it out for me. I colon V. Okay, now I actually have the solution. So let's save this. And you can see we're okay. We're finally passing. So I know that we're passing. That makes me happy. If you're curious about how this actually works, we're going to make a response variable, which is going to be the same length as queries. We're going to iterate over every query. We're going to initialize a counter. And then for every point, we're going to see if the point is in the query. And if it is, we're going to increase the counter. How do you know if a point is in a circle? Well, we know the radius of the circle, so we have to make sure that the distance from the point to the center of the circle is less than or equal to the radius. And how do you know how to do that? Well, you don't, you forget. So you go look up high school math and then you go, oh, right, I forgot. Okay, now that I have my solution, I'm gonna paste this into leak code. I'm gonna click run code. Looks like all my tests pass. I'm going to submit this. I can see that I was successful, that it took 28 milliseconds, and it was faster than 70% of Go Online submissions. But I shouldn't get so excited because this is incredibly inaccurate. If I run it again, I'll get different numbers. This time it's slower. This time it's faster. Next, I'm going to go to the discussion tab. I'm going to put Golang as a tag and look at the Golang solutions that exist. I'm going to sort by most votes and check and see how far off am I. But Go is not the most popular language on leak code. The most popular languages seem to be Java, Python, and C++. So I might look at a Python one-liner. That looks like nonsense. Or I might look at a C++ solution. Make sure it makes sense. Then I'm off to the next problem. Two sum. This one's impossible. That was a joke. So hopefully you learned something about how you can generate tests, how you can watch them, how your IDE can fill out ranges for you, how you can't trust your times with Go, and where to check to see that you're doing it right. I've actually started to like doing leak code problems now, but so far at work, I haven't been asked to invert a matrix, which is really sad.